coal, iron and steel. Table of contents, coal, iron and steel. The Industrial Revolution could not have developed without coal, iron and steel. Coal provided the power to drive the steam engines and was needed to make iron. Iron and steel were used to build the machines, railroads, and structures of the modern age. Dr. Sidney Soakcloth Dr. Sidney22 at gmail.com 2023 Narration by Dr. Sidney Soakcloth Zoe Phonemes and Nathan Cole Tove. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.1/ytnavigator. The Industrial Revolution could not have developed without coal and iron. Coal provided the power to drive the steam engines and was needed to make iron. Iron was used to improve machines and tools and to build bridges and ships. Great Britain's large deposits of coal and iron ore helped make it the world's first industrial nation. Consider the transition from using bronze, copper and tin alloy to iron in making tools and weapons, which occurred around the 12th century BC. Consider the transition from using bronze, copper and tin alloy to iron in making tools and weapons, which occurred around the 12th century BC, early in the second millennium BC. Iron was known as the stuff of meteorites. It was rare and highly prized. If you wanted to give a gift to a pharaoh or a king, you didn't give a gold dagger but an iron one. A technological revolution occurred when the eastern Mediterranean fell short of tin to make bronze. Artisans learned to extract metallic iron from iron-rich materials by heating them with charcoal, a process called smelting, which caused the price of iron to fall by 80,000 over 1200 years. The Iron Age had begun. These are the melting points of common metals and alloys. Iron has a very high melting point compared to other metals. Although plentiful, it is always in the form of iron oxide. And its high melting points was a significant obstacle in its use. Iron is plentiful in the Earth's crust. But in the form of oxides, hematite Fe2O3, or magnetite Fe3O4. Iron is everywhere. Iron forms much of Earth's outer and inner core, and is the fourth most common element in the Earth's crust. Unfortunately, iron has a very great appetite for oxygen. So, it is usually found as iron O. If as surrounded by oxygen atoms as hematite, Fe2O3 or by four oxygen atoms as magnetite, Fe3O4. But, in either case, it is what we call rust. Carbon has a greater affinity for oxygen than iron does. At very high temperatures, carbon will remove oxygen from the iron ore. This is called the reduction of iron ore in the form of magnetite. To pure elemental iron. The same process occurs with hematite, Fe2O3. This is called the reduction of iron ore in the form of hematite. To pure elemental iron. Carbon is needed both at a heat source and as a reducing agent to remove the oxide from iron oxides to produce elemental iron. 
In actuality, it is not solid carbon, but gaseous high temperature carbon monoxide, CO, that interacts with the iron ore and acts as the reducing agent and becomes carbon dioxide, CO2. Before the time of Abraham Darby in 1709, the source of carbon was charcoal made from heating wood in the absence or air to reduce it to charcoal. Coke is coal heated to remove impurities and leaves behind almost pure carbon. Coke has several significant advantages over charcoal. 1. Charcoal was made from wood, which became in very short supply too. Coke has a higher carbon content than charcoal, 86 to 88 percent, versus 65 to 85 percent. 3. Coke has less volatile matter than charcoal, less than 1 percent, versus 15 to 35 percent. 4. Coke is denser than charcoal. 500 to 550 kilograms per cubic meter versus 180 to 350 kilograms per cubic meter 5. Coke is 10 to 20 times stronger than charcoal, 130 to 160 kilograms per square cm versus 10 to 80. This last factor is very important in a blast furnace since coke can resist the crushing weight of the iron ore and limestone and allow for the flow of oxygen. This last factor of coke being 10 to 20 times stronger than charcoal, 130 to 160 kilograms per square cm versus 10 to 80 kilograms per square cm is very important in a blast furnace since coke can resist the crushing weight of the iron ore and limestone and allow for the flow of oxygen. In the furnace, the coke reacts with oxygen in the air blast to produce carbon monoxide. 2C plus O2 gives 2CO, or carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide reduces the iron ore, in the chemical equation below. It is hematite, to molten iron, becoming carbon dioxide in the process. Fe2O3 plus 3CO yields 2Fe plus 3CO2. Some iron in the high temperature lower region of the furnace reacts directly with the coke. 2Fe2O3 plus 3C yields 4Fe plus 3CO2. The flux is present to melt impurities in the ore principally silicon dioxide sand and other silicates. Typical fluxes include limestone, principally calcium carbonate, and dolomite, calcium magnesium carbonate. Other fluxes may be used depending on the impurities that need to be removed from the R in the heat of the furnace. The limestone flux decomposes to calcium oxide, also known as quicklime. CaCO3 yields CiO plus CO2. Then, calcium oxide combines with silicon dioxide to form a liquid slag. CiO plus SiO2 yielding CiSiO3. The slag melts in the heat of the furnace in the bottom of the furnace. The molten slag floats on top of the denser molten iron and apertures in the side of the furnace are open to run off the iron and the slag separately. The iron, once cooled, is called pig iron, while the slag can be used as a material in road construction or to improve mineral poor soils for agriculture. This is a diagram of a blast furnace. This is a diagram of a blast furnace showing the charging with iron ore, coke, and limestone. In years past, a bellows was used to produce a blast of air to raise the temperature in the furnace. This is an animation of the operation of the blast furnace. This is a short video of the operation of a blast furnace. Metallurgy Traditionally, metal industries had been small-scale, rural enterprises, situated near ore sources, forests provided charcoal for the smelting process, 
Chemical changes that occurred in steel making remained mysterious even to craftspeople who used them. Techniques had changed little since the beginning of the Iron Age, 2,500 years before. Later, another shortfall in Britain in the 1600s would drive still more invention. As the British Empire expanded, demands increased on the island nation's natural resources, particularly its forests. The British used so much wood for heating homes, building the ships of its mighty fleet and making charcoal to smelt iron and fuel other industrial processes that there was eventually a shortage called a timber famine in England. The British Isles were never heavily endowed with forests, and with the advent of Neolithic farming thousands of years earlier timber reserves became further depleted by the expansion of cropland and pasturage in the early modern era. Military and naval requirements, along with the beginnings of industrial intensification, placed increasing strains on a dwindling timber supply. Shipbuilding, for example, consumed vast quantities of timber. By the beginning of the 18th century, construction of a large man of war devoured 4,000 trees, and just before the American War of Independence, one third of the British merchant marine had to be built in the American colonies with timber remaining plentiful. The smelting of iron or another primary industry depleted whole forests, each furnace consuming the equivalent of four square kilometers of woodlands annually. Like the smelting and refining of iron, making bread, beer, and glass likewise depended on wood as a fuel in the form of charcoal, charred wood in these processes. Coal could not be substituted since its impurities, notably sulfur, would ruin when the fuel or its fumes came into direct contact with the product. Also, in the heating and lighting of buildings, Wood was preferred as a fuel since coal fires produced noxious fumes. As the scarcity of timber spread, its price inevitably rose. From 1500 to 1700, while general prices increased fivefold in England, the price of firewood rose tenfold. As a result of this energy crisis, by the beginning of the 18th century, British production declined due to a fuel shortage. This shows the depletion of the woodlands in the UK, leading to the timber famine. The timber famine of the 16th and 17th centuries led to a rapid rise in firewood prices, encouraging the shift to coal. As coal displaced timber, the land formerly devoted to woodland could be cleared for food production. The growing market for coal provided incentives to increase its production. But this, in turn, required new technologies like the steam engine for pumping water out of the mines. In turn, the steam engine provided new possibilities for substituting forms of transport that would allow the conversion of more land to raise food for people. That is, the substitution of the steam locomotive for horses. The significant change in the metal industries during the Industrial Revolution era was replacing organic fuels based on wood with fossil fuels based on coal. Much of this happened somewhat before the Industrial Revolution, based on innovations by Sir Clement Clerk and others from 1678. In the reverberatory furnace, the fuel, coal, is separated from the O so that sulfu and the impurities cannot diffuse into and contaminate the O. Instead, Hot gases from the firebox flow across the surface of the ore. These hot gases contain carbon monoxide, which reduces the iron oxides to elemental iron. This has the advantage that impurities, such as sulfur, in the coal do not migrate into the metal. 
This technology was applied to lead from 1678 and to copper from 1687. It was also applied to iron foundry work in the 1690s. But in this case, the reverberatory furnace was known as an air furnace. The foundry cupola is a different, and later, innovation. The reverberatory furnace could produce wrought iron using mined coal. The burning coal remained separate from the iron ore and did not contaminate the iron with impurities like sulfur. This opened the way to increased iron production. The flames operated these, which contained carbon monoxide, playing on the ore and reducing the oxide to metal. This has the advantage that impurities, such as sulfur, in the coal do not migrate into the metal. The reverberatory furnace could produce wrought iron using mined coal. The burning coal remained separate from the iron ore and did not contaminate the iron with impurities like sulfur. This opened the way to increased iron production. Wood shortages drove the use of coal. But coal had never been the choice fuel for smelting iron because it contained sulfur, which renders iron brittle. Indeed. King James II of Scotland was killed in 1460 by an exploding cannon from brittle iron. Metallurgy in the 1700s. Inventions by iron makers in the Colebrookdale region of English Midlands created a new scientific, large scale industry. Coke. Nearly pure carbon, which is derived from nearly pure coal replace charcoal in the smelting process. Large blast furnaces replaced the forge. Efficient rolling mills replaced hammers and anvils. And mass steel production resulted. Coal mining was the first industry to feel the effects of the new technology. The adoption of steam engines necessitated vast amounts of coal to fire boilers. The conversion to coke further increased the demand for coal. Fortunately, Britain had large coal deposits. New techniques and tools were invented, and coal mining became a large-scale mechanized industry. Until the early 18th century, iron working was restricted by practical considerations. The smelting of iron required large quantities of charcoal, with the result that ironworks were usually sited inaccessibly in the middle of forests, and charcoal was expensive. Charcoal is the dark gray residue of impure carbon obtained by removing water and other volatile constituents from animal and vegetation substances. Charcoal is usually produced by slow pyrolysis, heating wood or other substances in the absence of oxygen. The resulting soft, brittle, lightweight, black, porous material resembles coal. We will next have a short video clip on coal iron and steam. The Industrial Revolution takes off. By 1700, some of Britain's coal mines had reached depths of hundreds of feet and horse-powered water pumps ran night and day to control seepage. One man, Thomas Newcomen, was looking for a cheaper way to pump water, but his invention needed better quality iron. Iron smelting required charcoal. Charcoal provided heat and the carbon needed to extract the iron from the ore. You could only make a little bit at a time, so iron products were very expensive. Charcoal came from dwindling supplies of wood. By 1709, Abraham Darby was using coal as the source of both the carbon and heat in the smelting process. Abraham Darby began using coke in place of charcoal. Coke is coal that's been baked to remove tars and other impurities. He was able to make high-quality cast iron in larger batches, increasing the efficiency and reducing the cost. Just three years later, in 1712, Darby made cast iron parts for Thomas Newcomen's first commercial steam engine. The first major use of coal industrially was with a Newcomen 
steam engine. You heated the water, filled the cylinder with steam, cooled the steam, created a vacuum, and the cylinder pulled out. And they used for pumping water out of mines. The Newcomen steam engine was cheaper to run than horses. By 1760, more than 100 steam engines were pumping water out of mines across Great Britain, using cylinders cast at Colebrookdale. These new ways of using coal sparked the Industrial Revolution. The steam engine was a sea change in energy use. For the first time in history, humans are using energy from heat to power a machine, burning coal to make something move. It's a completely new way of using energy. Starting in the 1770s, James Watt made several improvements to Newcomen's steam engine. James Watt increased the efficiency of steam engines hugely from Thomas Newcomen's engine, so he doubled the power of steam engines overnight. Great for fuel economy. Wouldn't burn so much coal to do the same job. Now, more mine owners could afford to replace muscle power with machine. By 1790, the Industrial Revolution was gaining momentum. James Watt and his partner Matthew Bolton were producing coal-fired steam engines to pump water out of mines and even power a textile mill. The first Industrial Revolution was centered around coal and what people were able to do with that coal, which was the steam engine, and also the innovation of how to use coal to produce cheap metals. By the 19th century, steam engines were driving a fair old bit of industry, but water mills, windmills were still quite common, and so were animals. So gradually steam took over. It took over more gradually than people realised, because it was expensive. And one of the great things about the Bolton and Watt steam engine was it used much less coal. It was more efficient than the others. The Severn region became Britain's centre of iron production in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. Abraham Darby, the owner of an iron foundry at Colebrookdale along the Severn River in the west of England, solved this problem by developing a process to drive the unwanted impurities from coal, producing coke in 1709. Coke was so cheap that Darby could sell cast iron pots and kettles at prices accessible to the common folk. Abraham Darby made great strides using coke to fuel his blast furnaces at Colebrookdale in 1709. However, the coke pig iron he made was mainly used to produce cast iron goods such as pots and kettles. He had the advantage over his rivals in that his pots, cast by his patented process, were thinner and cheaper than theirs. The work of Abraham Darby is considered by many to be the cornerstone of the Industrial Revolution. His development of the coke burning blast furnace in 1709 made the mass production of commercial grade iron possible. The coke burning blast furnace, along with later improvements made by others, led to the evolution of the iron and steel industries and the many industries they spawned, aircraft, automobiles, shipbuilding, and construction. Darby was born near Dudley, Worcestershire, England in 1678. The iron industry at this time was hampered by its inability to produce sustained amounts of heat at high temperatures necessary for continuous smelting operations. In the 17th century, charcoal was the leading fuel for stoking, feeding, furnaces. As demand for iron grew, so did the demand for charcoal. This drove the price of charcoal higher. Also, soft charcoal could not physically support large amounts of iron nor inside the furnaces. Darby had been employed in the copper smelting industry in Bristol, England, where coke was used as fuel. Coke is a derivative of coal, produced by heating the coal and removing the sulfur and combustible impurities. Coke delivers a hotter, more sustained heat without flame. Coke became central to Darby's smelting process. When he established his Bristol Iron Works Company in 1708, he wisely chose the village of Colebrookdale, 
in the upper Severn River Valley and the west of England, where coal was readily available. Coke is a solid carbonaceous material derived from the destructive distillation of low ash, low sulfur bituminous coal. Cokes from coal are gray hearts and pores. Volatile constituents of coal, including water, coal gas, and coal to, are driven off by baking in an airless furnace or oven at temperatures as high as 2000 degrees Celsius. This fuses the fixed carbon and residual ash. Most modern facilities have byproduct coking ovens. Today, the volatile hydrocarbons are mainly used, after purification, in a separate combustion process to generate energy. Non byproduct coking furnaces or coke furnaces, ovens, burn the hydrocarbon gases produced by the coke making process to drive the carbonization process. To dig for coal, deep mine shafts were sunk, and these tended to flood. The steam engine was first developed to pump out the mines. The steam engine, in turn, became the primary new power source for the Industrial Revolution. All of this came about because of a shortage of wood. Eventually, this cycle of shortage and invention would lead to the canal system in England, railroads and thermodynamics. Darby's first iron products were primarily small implements and cooking utensils. His business was significantly bolstered by an order from Thomas Newcomen for cylinders for his steam-powered mine pumping engines. The engines, in turn, proved helpful in the blast furnace industry. Darby managed to keep the coking process within his family. His son, Abraham Darby II, continued making the Newcomen cylinders well after Darby's death in 1717. By 1758, 100 of the cylinders had been delivered by the Darby foundry. About 1750, Darby's son Abraham Darby II developed a process that made coke iron as easy to work as charcoal iron. After 1760, Coke smelting spread throughout Britain. Darby's grandson, Abraham Darby III, incorporated iron in construction when he collaborated with architect John Wilkinson on the Severn River Bridge at Iron Bridge Gorge in 1779. Well after Abraham III died in 1791. The Darby Foundry was commissioned by Richard Trevithick in 1802 to produce the first locomotive engine, which required a high press of steam boiler. This shows the location of the Iron Bridge Gorge. This shows the location of the Iron Bridge Gorge. This is an animation of the operation of a blast furnace. The area around Coal Brookdale grew into an iron-producing district in time. However, it became a victim of its own success, succumbing to the depletion of its coal reserves, pollution, and changing markets. However, North America and Asia's iron and steel-making industries can trace their origins to Coal Brookdale and Abraham Darby. Coke pig iron was hardly used to produce bar iron in forges until the mid-1750s when his son Abraham Darby II built horse hay and Ketley furnaces, not far from Coal Brookdale. By then, coke pig iron was cheaper than charcoal pig iron. Blast furnaces light up the iron-making town of Coal Brookdale. This shows the coal. Textile and other industrialized areas of Great Britain in the period 1750 to 1850. This shows the rapid growth of the per capita GDP in Great Britain at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution.
This shows the location of Colebrook Dale on the Severn River near Birmingham. This is a vintage painting of Colebrook Dale. This is another vintage painting of Colebrook Dale. This is a vintage painting of the ironworks at Colebrook Dale. This is the iron bridge over the River Severn. Built in 1779. Since iron was becoming cheaper and more plentiful, it also became a primary structural material following the building of the innovative iron bridge in 1778 by Abraham Darby III. This is the Iron Bridge Gorge and the Iron Bridge over the River Severn. This is an oath of view of the Iron Bridge over the River Severn. This is a drawing of the Iron Bridge over the River Severn. We will next have a short video clip on the operation of the Iron Bridge at Iron Bridge Gorge. The first iron bridge in the world, Iron Bridge Gorge. The Iron Bridge was built in 1779 and was the first cast iron bridge in the world. At more than 230 years old, it's still perfectly sound. Iron Bridge Gorge in the Midlands region of England was named after the bridge. During the Industrial Revolution, the area played a significant role. Many furnaces were built, and a quarter of the country's iron output was produced here. A groundbreaking iron-making method invented by Abraham Darby contributed to the development of what became known as iron villages. He used coke as fuel instead of standard charcoal. Coke is produced by steam-baking coal. The process removes sulfur contained in the coal and increases carbon purity, which then raises the burning temperature. This workshop shows exactly how iron products were made in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Here, molten hot iron is poured into a sand mold. Abraham Darby III, the grandson of Abraham Darby, insisted that the iron village should have an iron bridge. The bridge is 30 meters long and 12 meters high. Some 400 tons of iron were used to build the bridge. Iron bridge has a more intricate design than the wooden bridges, but some woodworking techniques were also used in the joint parts. The combination of traditional bridge making techniques and new technology worked extremely well. Decorations on the parapet are examples of the handcraft used in making the iron bridge. The bridge is still used by local people and will surely be so for a while yet. Iron Bridge is a tourist site as well as a living testimony of the Industrial Revolution. An improvement was made in the production of steel. An expensive commodity used only where iron would not do, such as for the cutting edge of tools and springs. Benjamin Huntsman developed his crucible steel technique in the 1740s. The raw material was blister steel, made by the cementation process. The supply of cheaper iron and steel aided the development of boilers, steam engines, and, eventually, railways. Improvements in machine tools allowed better working of iron and steel and further boosted the industrial growth of Britain. Mining Coal mining in Britain, particularly in South Wales, started early. Before the steam engine, pits were often shallow bell pits following a seam of coal along the surface, abandoned as the coal was extracted. In other cases, if the geology was favorable, the coal was mined using an added or drift mine driven into the side of a hill. Shaft mining was done in some areas, 
but the limiting factor was the problem of removing water. Shaft mining could be done by hauling buckets of water up the shaft or to a sough, a tunnel driven into a hill to drain a mine in either case. The water had to be discharged into a stream or ditch at a level where it could flow away by gravity. The introduction of the steam engine greatly facilitated the removal of water and enabled shafts to be made deeper, enabling more coal to be extracted. These were developments that had begun before the Industrial Revolution. But the adoption of James Watt's more efficient steam engine in the 1770s reduced the fuel costs of engines, making mines more profitable. Machine Tools The Industrial Revolution could not have developed without machine tools, for they enabled manufacturing machines to be made. They have their origins in the tools developed in the 18th century by makers of clocks and watches and scientific instrument makers to enable them to batch produce small mechanisms. The mechanical parts of early textile machines were sometimes called clockwork because of the metal spindles and gears they incorporated. Manufacturing textile machines drew craftsmen from these trades and is the origin of the modern engineering industry. Various craftsmen built machines, carpenters made wooden framings, and smiths and turners made metal parts. An excellent example of how machine tools changed manufacturing occurred in Birmingham, England, in 1830. The invention of the new machine by Joseph Gillett, William Mitchell and James Stephen Perry allowed the mass manufacture of robust, cheap steel pen nibs. The process had been laborious and expensive. Because of the difficulty of manipulating metal and the lack of machine tools, the use of metal was kept to a minimum. Wood framing had the disadvantage of changing dimensions with temperature and humidity, and the various joints tended to rack, work loose, over time. As the Industrial Revolution progressed, Machines with metal frames became more common, requiring machine tools to make them economically. Before the advent of machine tools, metal was worked manually using the basic hand tools of hammers, files, scrapers, saws and chisels. This readily made small metal parts. But production was very laborious and costly for large machine parts. Apart from workshop lathes used by craftsmen, the first large machine tool was the cylinder boring machine used for boring the large diameter cylinders on early steam engines. The planing machine, the slotting machine and the shaping machine we developed in the first decades of the 19th century. Military production, as well had a hand in the development of machine tools. Henry Maudsley, who trained a school of machine tool makers early in the 19th century, was employed at the Royal Arsenal Woolwich. As a young man, well he would have seen the large horse-driven wooden machines for cannon boring. Maudsley later worked for Joseph Brahma on producing metal locks, and soon after, he began working on his own. Brahma designed a lock and patented it in 1784. The locks produced by his company were famed for their resistance to lock picking and tempering. The company famously had a challenge lock displayed in the window of their London shop from 1790, mounted on a board containing the inscription. The artist who can make an instrument that will pick or open this lock shall receive 200 guineas, the moment it is produced. The challenge stood for over 67 years until, at the Great Exhibition of 1851, the American locksmith Alfred Charles Hobbs was able to open the lock and, following some argument about the circumstances under which he had opened it, was awarded the prize.
Hobbs attempt required about 51 hours. Spread over 16 days. The challenge lock is now in the Science Museum in London. This is the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich in the UK. Maudsley built the machinery for making ships pulley blocks for the Royal Navy in the Portsmouth block mills. These were all metal, and were the first machines for mass production and making components with a degree of interchangeability. The lessons Maudsley learned about the need for stability and precision, he adapted to the development of machine tools, and in his workshops, he trained a generation of men to build on his work, such as Richard Roberts, Joseph Clement and Joseph Whitworth. Pulley Blocks The Portsmouth block mills form part of the Portsmouth Dockyard at Portsmouth, Hampshire, England, and were built during the Napoleonic Wars to supply the British Royal Navy with pulley blocks. The Portsmouth Block Mills started the age of mass production using all metal machine tools and are regarded as one of the seminal buildings of the British Industrial Revolution. They are also the site of the first stationary steam engines used by the Admiralty. The Royal Navy used large numbers of blocks, all handmade by contractors. Their quality was not consistent. The supply was problematic and they were expensive. A typical ship of the line needed about 1,000 blocks of different sizes. And during the year, the Navy required over 100,000. Bentham had devised some machines for making blocks but did not develop them. And details of how they worked are now obscure. In 1802, Brunel proposed to the Admiralty a system of making blocks using machinery he had patented. Bentham appreciated the superiority of Brunel's system, and the Admiralty authorized him to proceed. There were three block-making machines, each designed to make a range of block sizes. They were laid out to allow production line, so each stage of the work progressed to the next in a natural flow. The first set, for medium blocks, was installed in January 1803. The second for smaller blocks in May 1803. And the third for large blocks in March 1805. This is the interior of the block mills, showing the overhead belt drive system used to power the manufacturing machinery designed and patented by Mark Isambard Brunel. Steel What is steel? Steel is an alloy that consists primarily of iron and has a carbon content between 0.2% and 2.1% by weight, depending on the grade. Carbon is the most common alloying material for iron, but various other alloying elements are used, such as manganese, chromium, vanadium and tungsten. Carbon and other elements act as a hardening agent, preventing dislocations in the iron atom crystal lattice from sliding past one another. Varying the amount of alloying elements in the form of their presence in the steel, solute elements. Precipitated phase, controls qualities such as the hardness, ductility, and tensile strength of the resulting steel. Steel with increased carbon content can be made more rigid and stronger than iron. But such steel is also less ductile than iron. Alloys with a higher than 2.1% carbon content are known as cast iron because of their lower melting point and good castability. Two distinguishing factors are steel's increased rust resistance and better weldability. Henry Bessemer Though steel had been produced by various inefficient methods long before the Renaissance, its use became more common after more efficient production methods were devised in the 17th century. 
With the invention of the Bessemer process in the mid-19th century, steel became an inexpensive mass-produced material. The Bessemer process was the first inexpensive industrial process for the mass production of steel from molten pig iron. The process is named after its inventor, Henry Bessemer, who took out a patent on the process in 1855. The process was also independently discovered in 1851 by William Kelly. The Bessemer process had also been used outside of Europe for hundreds of years, but not on an industrial scale. The key principle is the removal of impurities from the iron by oxidation, with air being blown through the molten iron. The oxidation also raises the temperature of the iron mass and keeps it molten. We will next have a short video clip on the operation of the Bessemer converter. The Bessemer process was the first inexpensive process for the mass production of steel from molten pig iron before the development of the open hearth process. The process revolutionized steel manufacture by decreasing the cost from 40 pounds per tonne to 6 to 7 pounds per tonne along with increasing the scale and speed of production. It was an extremely important invention because it enabled the manufacture of stronger metal machines and innovative architectural structures. In addition, cast iron rails were replaced with steel rails because they lasted 10 times longer. As a consequence of this invention, the Industrial Revolution moved from the age of iron to the age of steel. The construction of the Bessemer converter consisted of a pear-shaped steel frame which was lined with fire clay bricks to resist the high temperatures developed during the process. Excessive temperatures are prevented by the application of scrap iron to the converter. The process itself began with the pouring of molten iron together with an addition of lime at a temperature of 1300 degrees C into the mouth of the converter. A blast of air under high pressure was then applied to two ears located at the base of the converter. Initially, the silicon and manganese impurities present in the molten iron are oxidized to produce the slag in combination with the lime addition. As this process finishes, the oxidation of the carbon to carbon monoxide gas is initiated as evidenced by the blue flame at the mouth of the converter. Each of these oxidation processes is exothermic and during the 20 minute blow, the temperature rises to 1600 degrees centigrade, where in addition rocking of the converter on its central pivot aids the dispersion of both air and scrap iron within the molten iron. Slag is skimmed off the surface of the steel and at the end of the blow the converter is tilted and the molten steel poured into ladles. Additives such as ferromanganese and ferrosilicon are added as the molten steel is poured into the ladle to achieve the final chemical composition of steel required. The process is continuous from start to finish. The Bessemer process produced up to 30 tonnes per blow compared to 400 tonnes with a modern BOSS process in a typical processing time of 40 minutes. Newer iterations of the process in principle work and operate in a similar manner. Newer designs incorporate a combination of bottom blow with high speed top blow. This combined blow ensured both temperature and composition were homogeneous and the process became relatively quicker. The Bessemer process revolutionized steel manufacture by decreasing its cost by a factor of six during its introduction, along with significantly increasing the scale and speed of production of this vital raw material. The process also decreased the labor requirements for steel making. Before the introduction of the Bessemer process, 
steel was far too expensive to make bridges or the framework for buildings. So wrought iron had been used throughout the Industrial Revolution. After the introduction of the Bessemer process, steel and wrought iron became similarly priced, and most manufacturers turned to steel. The availability of inexpensive steel allowed large bridges to be built and enabled the construction of railroads, skyscrapers, and large ships. Nevertheless, the largest ship of the 19th century was the Iron SS Great Eastern, launched in 1858. High-pressure steam-powered locomotive railways appeared in 1825. With the opening of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, the first passenger railway opened in 1830 between Liverpool and Manchester. The first modern large suspension bridge was the Menai Suspension Bridge, completed in 1826, both decades before mass-produced steel. Basic Oxygen Steel Making also known as Linz Donowitz steel making or the oxygen converter process, is a method of primary steel making in which carbon rich molten pig iron is made into a steel. Blowing oxygen through molten pig iron lowers the carbon content of the alloy and changes it into low carbon steel. The process is known as basic because fluxes of burnt lime or dolomite, which are chemical bases, are added to promote the removal of impurities and protect the lining of the converter. Another process for converting carbon-rich iron into steel is the open hearth converter. This is a diagram of an open earth converter. The oxygen in the hot air reacts with the carbon in the iron to produce CO and CO2. This is an oath a diagram of an open hearth converter. This is a diagram of a basic oxygen furnace or BOF for steel making. Before casting, the steel can be refined with respect to levels of phosphorus sulfur, nitrogen and hydrogen. At the same time, its content of carbon, manganese and microalloying elements such as niobium, vanadium and titanium can be adjusted. This is a diagram of an electric oxygen furnace or EOF. The three-phase alternating current is supplied by the low voltage side, 300 to 700 volts of a high power transformer. These EOF furnaces have an inner diameter of 6 to 9 meters with a capacity of 100 to 200 tons of steel. The tap to tap cycle time for these furnaces is 90 to 110 minutes. Andrew Carnegie, 1835 to 1919, was a Scottish American industrialist, businessman, an entrepreneur who led the enormous expansion of the American steel industry in the late 19th century. He was also one of the most important philanthropists of his era. Carnegie built Pittsburgh's Carnegie Steel Company, which was later merged with Albert H. Erie's Federal Steel Company and several smaller companies to create U.S. steel. With the fortune he made from business, he built Carnegie Hall. Later Carnegie turned to philanthropy and interests in education, founding the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Carnegie Institution of Washington, Carnegie Mellon University, and the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. This is the Homestead Steelworks of the Carnegie Steel Company. These are the Gary Works of United States Steel. These are steel I-beams that are widely used for large structures, such as bridges and large buildings. These are various alloying elements that are added to steel to improve its strength or durability. These alloying elements are added to steel to improve its strength or durability. 
we will next have a series of short videos on the production of steel. This is a short video on the evolution of steel. Imagine taking a walk on the road. Tell me what you see. From the cars we drive to the buildings we work in, to the homes in which we live and countless many things in between. The one thing we'll find in common is steel. Steel has today become one of the most important materials serving countless manufacturing and construction markets. Steel was a discovery of the Iron Age, but it has evolved significantly over the past millennia. With heavy research and innovation, steel is now a key element present all around us. From small appliances to big machines, from cars to metro trains, from shipping to aviation, steel is the backbone of growth. This essentially means that steel is by far the most important and the most multifunctional material the world can thrive with. This is a short video on the raw material for the production steel of iron. Steel is the world's most important engineering and construction material. But how do we get it? Steel isn't readily available in the environment. So many materials are brought together to make steel. The primary material being iron, the major elemental component of steel. But iron is present in the Earth's crust in its oxidized form, which is called iron ore. Which is why we remove the oxygen and all the other impurities from the ore to get the iron we need to make steel. Then comes carbon. But again, carbon too isn't readily available for our use. So how do we get that? Simple. Coal. Coal is cleaned of impurities that results in an almost elemental form of carbon, which is called coke. There are a bunch of other materials too that are required to make steel, such as limestone that removes impurities like silica and sulfur, and other fuel gases to provide intense heat throughout the process of steel making. This is a short video on the blast furnace for the production of iron. Iron is the primary component of steel. However, we only find it in the environment in its raw form known as iron ore. But for the steel making process, we convert it into molten iron using coke and limestone. But how is it done? We do so by using a blast furnace. A blast furnace is a giant cylinder that converts iron oxide into liquid or molten iron. The cylinder has a tube at the bottom that blasts intense heat inside. Iron ore is added from the top which reacts with the coke to remove oxygen while the limestone reacts with the impurities of the iron ore and coke to form slag. The final output is molten iron with a top layer of slag which is easily removable for further processing. Imagine oil on top of water. So there you have your blast furnace. But that's not all. So stay tuned for the next video in our Steel Making 101 series to learn how this liquid iron ore is processed to make steel in the steel melting shop. This is a short video on the production of steel. Steel is produced using molten iron which we obtain from a blast furnace. However, the molten iron must get oxidized first to use it in the steel making process. But how? It is achieved with the help of the steel melting shop, which aims to convert molten iron into steel and steel into semi-finished steel products. By refining the molten iron and casting it into steel, which is both strong and flexible. The steel melting shop is essentially split into two parts, primary and secondary. The primary steel making process leverages two technologies, basic oxygen furnace and the neo-electric oxygen furnace. Secondary steel making on the other hand involves a ladle refining furnace, vacuum degassing and casting of steel. So stay tuned for the next video in our Steel Making 101 series to understand how a basic oxygen furnace actually works. This is a short video on the basic oxygen furnace for the production of oxygen steel. through carbon-rich molten iron 
to lower its carbon content and convert it into steel. But how is this done? It is done through two technologies, the basic oxygen furnace and the neo electric oxygen furnace. Let us understand the basic oxygen furnace in a little more detail. Steel scrap is added to the basic oxygen furnace along with molten iron coming from the blast furnace. Oxygen is blown through a lance into the hot metal bath with a very high flow of 1000 normal cubic meters per minute. The oxygen then reacts with impurities like carbon, silicon, manganese and phosphorus present in the molten iron to produce steel. The carbon and silicon in the hot iron release a huge amount of heat energy to facilitate the reaction leaving carbon monoxide, gas and dust. All the gases released are collected, cooled, cleaned and recovered for use as fuel in other areas. This process ensures that impurities such as silicon, manganese and phosphorus are removed from the metal in the form of slag and a steel with lower impurities and carbon content less than 0.2% is produced. Okay, so stay tuned for the next video in our Steel Making 101 series to learn about another primary steel making technology, the Neo Electric Oxygen Furnace. This is a short video on the neoelectric oxygen Primary furnace steel for the production making of steel. Forcing oxygen through carbon-rich molten iron to lower its carbon content and convert it into steel. But how is it done? It's done through two technologies, basic oxygen furnace and the new electric oxygen furnace. Let us understand the new electric oxygen furnace in a little more detail. NEOF is the first of its kind flexible modular furnace installation in Asia. It's a batch process where steel scrap and direct reduced iron is melted by heat of electric arcs striking between the furnace electrodes and the metal bath. The scrap is charged from the furnace top. The melting process starts at a low voltage between the electrodes and the scrap. Other input materials like DRI, fluxes, carburizer and oxygen are then gradually added to the furnace as per the requirement. Oxygen is added for refining purposes so that different metallurgical reactions can occur to remove impurities and slag. Once furnace temperature hits 1600 degrees Celsius, the bath temperature and percentage of carbon and phosphorus are checked. Steel is then tapped through an eccentric bottom tap hole to retain slag at the bottom of the furnace, likely making the steel cleaner. That was all about primary steel making. Steel flow lines. Production. This shows the processing flow from the basic raw materials of iron or coal and limestone to cast iron and steel. Steel flow lines. Processing. This shows the processing flow from cast steel to various rolled and extruded products such as pipes, sheets, coils, tubes, structural beams, and bars and rods. This diagrammatically shows the evolution of the multitude of steel productions from the basic raw materials of iron or coal and limestone. This again shows the processing flow from the basic raw materials of iron or coal and limestone to steel. And then processing to various rolled products such as pipes, sheets, coils, tubes, structural beams, bars and rods. This again shows the processing flow from the basic raw materials of iron ore, coal and limestone to steel and then processing to various cast steel products such as slabs and billets. This shows the processing flow from the basic raw materials of iron ore, coal, and limestone to iron from the blast furnace and then converted to molten steel from the basic oxide furnace. This again shows the processing flow from the basic raw materials of iron ore, coal, and limestone to iron from the blast furnace and then converted to molten steel from the basic oxide furnace. This shows the basic steps in making iron and steel. Recommended videos. Coal. Iron and steel. Recommended video. The drama of steel.
Recommended video, the Bessemer process and Bessemer converter, how they work. Recommended video, how iron is made. Animation. Recommended video, what is coking coal? And where is it used? Recommended video, coal, iron, and steam, the industrial revolution takes off. Recommended video, Colebrookdale, Origins of the Industrial Revolution, Dennis Smith 1985. Recommended video, Iron Bridge Gorge, UNESCO NHK. Recommended video, Steel Making 101, The Evolution of Steel. Recommended video, Steel Making 101, Raw Materials. Recommended video, Blast Furnace, the cornerstone of steel making. Recommended video, Steel Melting Shop. Recommended video, Steel Making 101, Basic Oxygen Furnace. Recommended video, Steel Making 101, Neo Electric Oxygen Furnace. Recommended video, YouTube navigation, table of contents, coal, iron and steel. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.